Susan, thank you so much for joining us today and being willing to be our first person. Thank you. We are thank so thrilled. Thank you for having me. You, um, you, could, you could sit here with us for the entire afternoon and evening and only touch on all that you can share, but we have to compress it into one hour, so we'll, we'll begin, if you don't mind. <laughs> Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933, the year before your birth. Before you tell us about what you and your family went through during the Holocaust and during World War II, tell us first a little a bit about your family and you in the early years before war began. Well, in my tricycle days, when I was very young, um, I had, I guess, what everybody would uh, consider a happy childhood. I was an only child, uh, cherished, loved, um, and uh, protected, really, um, shielded from outside problems. Um, my father was a dentist and also developed and owned a dental laboratory in Budapest and um, made a decent living. We were by no means wealthy, but it was a comfortable middle-class existence. Um, uh, I never really knew hardship until I was, oh, about maybe six years old, six or seven years old. I'm telling you this because I think that that early stability and love and um, freedom uh, of spirit uh, probably made it possible for me to survive uh, emotionally as well as mm -hmm. physically what happened later. Tell us a little bit about your mother. Well, uh, <laughs> my mother had, uh, my mother was 18 years younger than my father which in those days in Europe wasn't all that extraordinary, but it was still pushing the limits of uh, the usual arrangement. And um, she has lost both her mother and her only sister at a young age, and was actually brought up by her second cousins, um, and my father was one of them. Uh, the four brothers really kind of uh, mentored her and mm -hmm. took care of her. And um, when uh, my father was about 42 years old, it finally dawned on him that this young woman uh, whom he protected and cherished was really a beautiful person and they loved each other and got married and then they had me. Yes. Your, um, your parents moved from the Pesh part of Budapest, where their dental practice was located, to Buda. Why, why did they make that move? When I was very young, um, the tricycle picture, uh, shortly after the tricycle picture, my father has suffered all his life from something that I, it's very hard to uh, tell uh, what the diagnosis would be today, but very much like emphysema. So the polluted air of Pest, which is the industrial and city part, business mm -hmm. part of um, uh, Budapest, um, the air quality was very poor. So uh, for his health, uh, we moved to Buddha, uh, which is a beautiful, hilly, naturally um, endowed uh, place in the hills. Uh, we had a garden and um, a flat at that point, not, not a whole house. Um, it was a lovely, lovely place to grow up. We had a garden. I could climb the trees and uh, be outdoors, which was a passion of mine, actually, from very early on. Mm -hmm. We mentioned in the introduction with the slides that um, uh, just before the war, your uncle moved with his family um, uh, to England. You were very close to his children, and, and tell us why your father did not go with him, because Laszlo wanted him to come, and what it meant to you when they left? A very good question. Mm -hmm. I'm still wondering, still, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, my father was a wonderful man, a bright, uh, charismatic, uh, great leadership uh, abilities. Uh, uh, we can talk to, about him later, uh, all the things he accomplished. However, he was a hopeless idealist. And mm -hmm. he, like so many other people at that time, it might be difficult for you to believe that after what everybody here has been witnessing, certainly the last 50, 60 years, 
um, around the world, but he really did not believe that civilized people would descend to the depths of violence and, and savagery as they actually did. Uh, after all, uh, Germany and certainly uh, the intelligentsia in uh, Hungary were highly civilized, highly educated people, loved classical music and read literature and poetry and philosophy, and how could they become savages? It was unthinkable, but it happened. And it began with World War II starting September 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. The full impact of the war, of course, wouldn't come to Hungary till several years later. Tell us what those first years of the war were like for your family um, before it really got unbearably awful. Well, um, of course, remember, I was a very young child, right, right. and I was protected from the worst of it. But by that time, um, various anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic laws uh, came into being. For instance, you couldn't really go to university. First, uh, only, I don't know, 5%. I don't mm -hmm. know the exact figures. I have not looked it up. But very few Jews were, would be accepted in higher education, uh, institutions of higher education. Um, certain professions became gradually barred uh, from Jews. So my father obviously felt, the, mm -hmm. and so did my mother, the impact of this. And increasingly there was some social isolation and discrimination. Um, it didn't touch me directly because A, I was an only child, as uh, I already uh, stated. My cousins were gone. That was a big loss. Mm -hmm. and there were no other children in the family. I didn't really have uh, friends as a young child before going to school um, because of the isolation of where we lived. So it did not affect me until kindergarten age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I began to experience uh, uh, discrimination after 1940. After 1940. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I can... Say a little more about that, yeah. Well, <laughs> you're a self-confident kid, and then suddenly when you're in school, they call you dirty Jew. And I remember being very puzzled by that because my mother was a stickler for hygiene. So I was extremely <laughs> clean. Uh, yeah. You know, I didn't quite know about metaphor at that point. So I knew I wasn't dirty, and uh, so why am I being called dirty? The Jew bit also puzzled me because we were not observant Jews. I mean, we did the high holidays at distant relatives' houses uh, because, you know, we were Jewish. But my father was pretty much an agnostic um, with uh, humanistic values. He uh, was highly moral. He made sure that uh, I was well versed both in the Old and in the New Testament um, and uh, ethics and um, morals, but he was not a religious person. So uh, I, I knew about the Jewish tradition and was very proud of it because it was so old, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I did not, uh, we did not participate in a congregation or a community, which became a problem because I didn't have that kind of support. Support. Yeah. At, at some point, you had some distant relatives, I think from Transylvania, who came to visit, and you said their visit caused, you told me that it caused you these feelings of genuine foreboding. Well, interesting you would bring that up. So here I am a protective kid, uh, protected kid, uh, not really knowing what's going on and exposed only to my father's uh, very hopeful, very upbeat sense that the war will be over, the Allies will, uh, with their superior uh, military uh, might and uh, technology will vanquish the Germans in no time, everything will be cool, right? So one day, um, maybe five or six, I really don't mm -hmm. remember how many strangers show up. And to me, they were truly strangers or out of a book that, that I have read. They were Hasidic Jews, somewhere from Romania, what's now Romania, Transylvania, from mm -hmm. early, 
uh, and you know, they wore strange clothing and had the hats and everything that I haven't seen until now except in book. And they joined us for the beautiful Sunday dinner, which we had every Sunday, the table full of wonderful home-cooked food and uh, uh, conversation and happiness. And here they were, and they were messengers of doom. They were telling us what was happening um, in uh, Transylvania, um, where uh, uh, Jews were killed, small communities were um, uh, wiped out, not even decimated, and they talked to us about concentration camp. Now, you know, I was a kid, I understood half of it, but, but somehow I was hit with an understanding, an emotional uh, impact, really, mm -hmm. of that something terrible is happening, not was happening, is happening. So it was like, uh, mm -hmm. they were the messengers of Doom. And I remember it was like a clouds, the clouds came over the sky. It was a beautiful day. And I just, darkness descended. Yeah. Um, that's a very powerful image of feeling that as a child. Yeah. That's really what I remember, yeah. because as a child you don't have too many words, uh, yeah. otherwise you'd have lots of words. Um, and I remember I just couldn't eat anymore. I just had to leave the table. And from then on, I knew that uh, things were not good. With the war on, the Allies began bombing Budapest. You shared with me that you and your father would stand on the balcony and say a little bit about that. Well, yes. Um, you know, anybody here uh, witnessed uh, an air, you know, uh, air battle? Uh, okay, it's in, it was in those days, now you have jets and missiles, so it's, it's, I guess it's not that spectacular. But um, here are the uh, Allied bombers coming over the city. Now, we are in Buddha, right? We feel very safe because at that time, only the industrial targets were um, bombed. So that's over in the Pest. But that part, was yeah. in Pest, and yeah. the outskirts, way okay. away from Pest, so Pest itself wasn't bombed. So what a child sees is this dust in the, car, in the sky, and then you see the artillery fire, and then see the fighter pilots taking off. It, it was really a spectacle. And then, and here the sinister stuff comes in, you suddenly see uh, explosions, you know, uh, very colorful when planes get hit and explode. And, and they go down. Um, so anyway, I was playing in the garden. Actually, I was on my favorite uh, cherry tree. I like the climb tree. And <coughs> my father uh, calls me up. Come on, you've got to see this. And so I go up to the balcony and join him. And uh, I don't understand why he's so happy. And I said, well, how can you tell which one is which? I mean, I couldn't tell when the plane came down whether it was a friend, friendly plane or whether it was... Uh, uh, the Nazi military, um, I think she, she thought, he thought that he could tell. But in any case, mm -hmm. what he got away from this, and my father was not stupid, uh, that the war will be over. That's what he told me. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a display of superior air power, and the war will never really come here, and we will be free in no time at in all. In no time, yeah. I want you to tell us about, um, you were, you were, f told you must, I guess at school, you must knit socks for, <laughs> Hungar for Hungarian soldiers. That you, this is your patriotic duty. Well, okay. Um, I started out uh, in a private school uh, kind of a year early. And um, so after a while you were uh, not allowed if you were Jewish, to go to any private schools. And this particular school was uh, shut down because it was uh, affiliated with the uh, British Embassy anyway. So I had to restart the same grade um, in a public school. Well, in the public school, this was the time when Hungarian troops were uh, forced to fight on the Russian front, which was, of course, the worst possible place to fight in Siberia. It was very cold, it was a very harsh environment. 
So um, one of the, I guess, the equivalent of home ec uh, classes, we were taught how to knit and we were ordered to knit for the troops, you know, uh, scarves and socks uh, to keep them warm. And I was in a conundrum because uh, I didn't really want to support, uh, to me, enemy troops because uh, I did not want them to win. On the other hand, they were the relatives, the brothers and fathers of my schoolmates, and I did not want them to freeze either. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it was an interesting, uh, if I look back on it, um, a <laughs> problem. And characteristically, the way I solved it in the end was to knit, but I'm not a good knitter anyway, so it wasn't a big effort. But I made sure they were very ugly socks and very <laughs> ugly scarves. And th that's what I did. So I'm not proud of it, but that's what I did. At, at some point, of course, you and your family were forced to leave your home in the Buddha part of Budapest and go to Pesh. Where were you forced to go, and, and what did that mean for you? Okay, so things kept on getting worse. Um, and so uh, Buddha, which was a nice place, uh, Jews were not allowed to live in Buddha at all. So we were ordered out of our flat, leaving all our um, belongings behind. Everybody was allowed to pack a suitcase, not a very big suitcase that you could carry. Um, I remember packing my books and a, a little doll called Peter. Uh, my son is called now Peter. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were forced out, and, and like this was immediate. It's not that you got a, a few months' notice to prepare. You know, from it was one day to yeah. another, yeah. 48 hours. Um, and um, we had to move into a marked house, certain houses in the Pesh were designated as Jewish houses, and there would be a huge, big, Mag and David Jewish star. Um, above the entrance, uh, designating it so everybody would know that this uh, only pariahs lived there, you know, mm -hmm. not real people. Um, and we moved into an apartment with several other families, and the apartment, uh, it was a very nice, spacious apartment for two people. However, it was now, I don't know, four or five families. It had one... Four or that, five families. Yeah. yeah. And there were like there was one bathroom, full bath, and one toilet, uh, and we had to share that, and of course one kitchen. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And and at that time, you told me that food really began to get scarce. Yeah. Um, will you say a little bit about that and what you were able to do about it? Well, you know that was a gradual transition uh, from uh, plenty, but I experienced this plenty. And my family was always, well, Hungarians in general are very food-oriented, Jews are food-oriented, so you put the two get together, you know that um, you had plenty of good food around at all times. Um, and then, um, as uh, the war uh, progressed, um, of course, all the resources were um, redirected towards the military and the front. Mm -hmm. Uh, able-bodied men were uh, taken away from farming and uh, fewer, uh, much less food was produced. At any rate, um, it was very scarce and uh, everybody was rationed, not just Jews. However, we uh, were under curfew. We were allowed out only two or three hours uh, a day in the late afternoon and of course by that time all the food was gone from the stores, or at least more, most of it was gone. So that was the only time you were allowed to shop in that one late afternoon period? Or to just get out. Yeah, or to yeah. just get out period, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we had to wear yellow stars. I remember my mother cutting out, it had to be a certain color of yellow. I, I still don't understand why that was, mm -hmm. but they were very, the Nazis were very particular. Mm -hmm. So, and it had to be a certain size, and they were quite big, uh, about, well, this big. And it had to be sewn on all the, imagine that you have to, it's like the scarlet letter, except much bigger, right? Um, so when you are out on the street, everybody knows that you are a Jew, which means that they can abuse you, and they did. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Jewish men were forced to go to labor battalions yes. uh, to help the, the Hungarians 
in their fight with the, with, with the Nazis against the Russians. What, what happened to your father when he was forced to go to the labor battalion? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know how that uh, was arranged. Uh, I never found out. But he was, of course, um, because he was, uh, he was able to return after several weeks, which was a good thing because mm -hmm. he had this emphysema thing and he couldn't have survived um, heavy labor um, for any length of time. So we were very, very scared uh, while he was away. I remember my mother taking uh, uh, all kinds of uh, scarce public transportation at that time to visit him way outside of the city, mm -hmm. uh, taking him some food uh, and um, making sure that he was okay. But one day he reappeared and um, uh, he was with us then, uh, throughout, until the end of the war, although we'll talk about we'll that, talk he about was that, later yeah. Yeah. wounded. Yeah. As terrible things were for Jews in Hungary at that time, of course, they turned so dramatically worse in March of 1944 when the Germans occupied Hungary. Tell us how things changed and, and what you recall of that once the Germans were now in control of Hungary. Okay, so um, imagine that you are experiencing kind of the way I now visualize it as a gradual descent to hell, you know? Um, you um, are abused, discriminated against, uh, ousted from your home, uh, from your environment, uh, suddenly uh, having to share a scarce, uh, very scarce uh, resources, both physical and um, spatial resources with uh, lots of others, uh, very little food. Although for the longest time I didn't starve because of course my parents, whatever food there was, they would save it for me. Uh, and I didn't realize of course the sacrifice at the time, but uh, that's how it was. But then at that point, um, there was no food, basically. Bread was highly, highly cherished. Uh, meat disappeared altogether. We eat beans uh, and, that was, and potatoes. That was the highlight because potatoes were great. Later on, that disappeared mm -hmm. entirely. Mm -hmm. Also, the bombardments uh, started, the allies, allies intensified uh, the air raids and the sirens um, alerting us mm -hmm. to the bombardment would, at the beginning, maybe a couple of times a day, usually in the afternoon. So you could kind of prepare for that. But then eventually it was like practically nonstop. Now the problem with that was, that we didn't have air raid shelters, um, or there were a few, but certainly not for us. Um, so people would um, try to find shelter in the cellar, and I mean cellar, uh, full with coal. Well, at that time the coal and the wood was gone because uh, the infrastructure crumbled, right. so there would be no electricity eventually. At this point, we had electricity maybe two, three hours a day, and then we would have some hot water to wash in, otherwise it would be cold water. Anyhow, so um, those circumstances were rather difficult. And so in the overcrowded houses to get down in the cellar, you really had to hurry and then you couldn't find any place to be. So pretty soon I tried not to go down there because it was like how people were sick, they were uh, moaning, they, they, were, they had anxiety attacks because if you got a direct hit you were killed. And um, I very often, I remember how houses around uh, uh, did take direct hits. And our house also took some hits, but if it was a firebomb, that was okay because that didn't blow up the whole house, mm -hmm. uh, the whole building. And the men organized themselves so they would be carrying water up to the roof mm -hmm. or wherever the fire started to extinguish it. And sometimes we children were allowed to help in doing that. So that at least gave you something to do. Yeah. I, I want you to tell us about that extraordinary incident where you were 
had an opportunity to go on an outing to Buddha? Um, okay. Um, I told you about uh, growing up in, the, in Buddha, in the uh, hills, and I was um, always happiest outside. And one of the places, uh, Budapest, by the way, if you have a chance, visit it. It's a beautiful, beautiful city, um, full of natural springs, and uh, from Roman times on, and uh, all kinds of spas and swimming pools uh, are built around those natural springs. So I'm telling you this because one of my favorite places um, as a child growing up uh, was to go to these um, swimming pools which were surrounded by park-like area. So anyhow, here I am uh, <laughs> uh, shut up in this danky old building uh, in the city, not being allowed out. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a few children around and we would play in, uh, in the stairwells. <laughs> These are old houses, you know, building, um, running up and down, and then there would be a courtyard, and a very small courtyard surrounded by, uh, on all four sides by, I don't know how many stories. Anyhow, it, uh, not, no sunlight and no outdoors, right? So suddenly, one day, one of my father's uh, dental assistants, actually a beautiful woman, and who became a friend, shows up, with a German officer, a Wehrmacht officer. So the whole house goes into panic because German officers, uh, Wehrmacht officers, not that they were German, but they were Wehrmacht, um, they're bad news. SS was very bad news, but even Wehrmacht was not good news. However, it turned out that uh, they came, brought some food, and uh, Vivian knew me, and she said, you look kind of, you know, very pale and kind of unhappy. Would you like to go to the pool? I said, yeah. And my parents said, no way. I mean, that's extremely dangerous. You get caught, you get killed. And the Wehrmacht officers are not with me, you know. He was a young guy. And so they finally let me go. So we had to go to the Buddha side. And it's a beautiful sunny day. And you can't imagine, it's like, if anybody was ever in prison, it, I, I, I wasn't, but... Uh, it must be the feeling, you know, after solitary confinement or something like that, you're finally outdoors. Mm -hmm. And so I loved it. And this was a very special pool equipped in those days that was unheard of, this wave machine. Does anybody know wave what a wave machine, machine is? <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. But that was the best you could do in Hungary, uh, which was landbound. You know, mm -hmm. I've never seen the ocean before. So it was a wave machine. So there I was, happy, very happy. And then suddenly, again, uh, something hit me, uh, I mean, internally. It's like a darkness descended. It, I guess it was a foreboding. And I suddenly knew I had to get out of there. Mm -hmm. So I went back uh, and I said, we got to go. They said, why? You know, everything is fine. We got to go. And, and they heard the urgency in my voice. Uh, and we hastily packed up and left and went back home. So I had a beautiful few hours, mm -hmm. and then I got back home, you know, to the Jewish house. Well, next day they called us up. Uh, uh, yeah, I think we still had telephone. Um, and told us that not 10 minutes after we finally left, uh, the police came looking for a little Jewish girl. Yeah. So somebody must have recognized me mm -hmm. and reported that I was there. And so ever since then, I really trust my intuition. I check it out, but I trust my trust intuition. Trust it totally yeah. now, yeah. yeah. You, you were abruptly forced out of the Jewish house. Um, tell us where you were forced to go and then what happened once you were forced from there. Well, um, okay, now we are talking later in 1944, which was really the worst part of Nazi uh, terror. Um, the, act, when I say worst part, um, the government, which was of course pro-Nazi government before 
led by somebody called Horty, uh, Miklos Horty, did stop some of the more extreme violence in Budapest. Um, but the Hungarian Arrow Cross uh, took over and that was the, fascist the party, country, yeah. which was the fascist Nazi yeah. party installed by Hitler. Uh, <coughs> and then all hell broke loose. You remember, the city is under uh, constant air raids, uh, supplies are not there, everybody suffers. Um, but you are segregated from everybody else and uh, you get uh, very few resources, but at least you're not being killed, not yet. Uh, we started hearing about um, the concentration camps and deportations from the countryside because that's where they started it all, but it didn't quite hit Budapest yet, which is why we were overcrowded because on top of all the people who lived in the um, apartment, um, refugees from the countryside mm -hmm. who were fleeing the deportation would show up uh, if they knew somebody in the house. And uh, so we had this uh, constant migration. So now the Arab Cross was interestingly uh, populated mostly by young, uh, rootless uh, people who themselves, I think, um, knew hardship and didn't have a vocation or an occupation. They were given guns and weapons and they were told that uh, it's free for all uh, as far mm -hmm. as Jews were concerned. So they would roam the street and come in and raid the Jewish houses, which were readily identifiable, of course. And it would just herd everybody out without any rhyme or reason or scheduling. Or, you know, it, it would, you never knew when it would hit. So we actually had sentries. The men organized themselves uh, to forewarn. Mm -hmm. But the forewarning was maybe five minutes at most when they saw people coming down the street. So anyhow. Um, and on one occasion that I remember very clearly, we were all at a moment's notice really herded out of the house. Men, women, children, the elderly, the sick, everybody. And you didn't have time to grab anything uh, with you. So whatever was in your hand or, or try to get a coat or something. So we were then herded through the streets of Budapest to be sorry, and had about our heads. And I was a kid, I could do that. But uh, it was hard for my father, mm -hmm. it was hard for older people. And this went on for hours. We were marched all around the city. And crowds, sure, there were some people who were sympathetic, but they had to keep their mouth shut because uh, it was dangerous to show support. But many people, whatever we had a coat or a scarf, they would grab it uh, away from us and they would be jeering. and. It was horrible. Oh. It, it was humiliating and horrible. So and eventually, we, uh, after hours of this, I think it was a couple of hours, maybe longer. Um, oh, and you couldn't drop your arms. You had to keep your hands uh, up. Because then you got shot. So, and, and people did get shot, uh, who couldn't hold their arms up after a while. So we were heard to the synagogue. Uh, there's a huge, big synagogue uh, still there, and now it's refurbished. Uh, actually, a beautiful building. Um, and already it was crowded and uh, with people like us. And then the overcrowding was horrible. I don't want to spell it out. And of course, we were held there without food, without bathroom facilities, uh, etc. Um, for a couple of days. Um, and then periodically groups of people would be removed. And um, we knew, you know, through the grape and the information was there, they were taken to the um, railroad uh, at the brick factory and uh, where they were um, deported to Auschwitz or the other concentration camps in these uh, carts, railroad carts. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyhow, so we knew it was just a question of time uh, that we would be taken as well. But we weren't. Life was so irrational then. 
Uh, suddenly, after two days of this, uh, and it was terror, abject terror, um, we were told to go home, to go. And we had no idea why, just like we didn't have any idea why we were taken there. Um, so we went home to the Jewish house. Mm -hmm. um, and it felt like a reprieve, and it was a reprieve, yeah. A reprieve, yeah. And then from there, you would find refuge for a period. Well, even my idealistic father, who by that time had to accept that the unacceptable and the unthinkable was in fact happening, mm -hmm. realized, because he was a pra also a very practical man, actually, um, that we couldn't stay there. Uh, we had to get out somehow. But you couldn't get out at that point from the country, certainly, or from Budapest. So uh, the only thing that seemed um, like a safer place was to get into the international ghetto. We were in the old ghetto, what became the old ghetto almost as soon as we moved out. Um, and he somehow secured a Spanish affidavit uh, for us. So we moved into, um, which turned out to be fake, of course, but we didn't know that. Um, so we had moved to a different part of town, uh, which was on the map, by the way. Right, right. Um, and that's where we barely survived the rest of the war. And of course, as you mentioned earlier, the bombardments are getting more and more intense while you're even in, in, in now in the new place that you are in the Spanish right, house. At that point, they were nonstop. They were uh, nonstop I mean, yeah. the sirens were pointless because by the time you heard the sirens, the bombs were yeah. falling. You shared with me that um, as, as they were rounding up and grabbing Jews where they could find them, some of them were being taken to the Danube River uh, and shot right there in the river. And, and you were in a place where you could see what was going on from your building. Well, that was pretty surreal. Um, now, I told you that uh, the Jewish house was crowded, but this place was like people slept all over the floor. I had a privileged place under the piano uh, because I was small enough I fit there. And, you know, these houses, whoever owned them or lived them before they were already gone, but the furniture was there. So uh, that didn't help the crowding. So, um, the situation in the air raid shelters were much worse. It was like, if anybody ever read uh, The Lower Deaths by Dostoevsky, I can highly recommend it. It's a beautiful book. Um, but it was like that. It was like being in hell uh, in that cellar. Of course, there is no light. By then, there is no electricity. There is no food. People are sick. There are no doctors. They are moaning. The dead are not taken away because there is no place to take them away. It was bad. So I tried not to be done there at all. Um, my mother was down there, but my father and I often went up, if, even though it was very dangerous, to the apartment. So from there, uh, he could overlook the Danube. Uh, there is a park, there was a park there. And um, so groups of people were taken from neighboring protected houses, mostly at that point from the Swiss protected houses. For some reason, that was. Um, they disregarded that, uh, the Nazis did, mm -hmm. almost immediately. And what I saw was not that they were shot. I saw them there, and then from one minute to another, they were gone. Mm -hmm. So you knew they didn't left because it was a group of people. You would have seen them leaving, but they were gone. And they were in the distance, so you didn't hear the gunshots, especially not. Uh, at that point, there was already artillery. Uh, Budapest was under artillery siege. It was surrounded by the Soviet army. Um, so you couldn't hear anything, but we knew. We knew what happened. And then later on, if you ever go to Budapest, and you go down to the Danube, you will see the sculpture of shoes, of shoes. Because you see, the Nazis were very efficient. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if there are young people who are traumatized by this, but they would have to remove their shoes before they were shot and thrown into the dining It was that kind of savagery. It was totally, totally incredible. As the Russians advanced, 
and began to completely besiege the city, you're right in the middle of the siege that was going on. Well, tell us a little bit about that and then about your liberation. And, well, and it, while you're thinking, one of the lines you said to me that at this point now, everyone is starving and bread, this was your words, bread was like diamonds. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, um, food became, you learned the lesson um, that possessions are irrelevant, you know. Uh, food is sustaining life, so uh, yes, uh, we didn't have, of course, any bread. Uh, and I have other stories about what happened to some jewelry my mother had, and, yeah. uh, but that was actually even after the war. So um, I, there was a bakery close by, which was open for a few hours, still functioning. But of course, we couldn't get there because at that point we couldn't get out of, of the house at all. But I was, what, I was maybe nine then or 10, and it didn't look particularly Jewish. And uh, I mean, the idea of uh, the people then what Jewish looks like. And so um, I decided that A, I had enough in the house and B, uh, my parents would really love some bread. Moreover, I would love some bread. So I gave it, gave it a try. So I, I snuck out and uh, went several blocks uh, where there was, of course, a long line at the bakery. And I stood in line, but some people took p actual pity on me uh, and let me advance in the line, uh, which was great. Uh, but I felt like a f fraud, really, because here I was, you know, masquerading like I was human, right? Um, so at any rate, I did get a loaf of bread. Mm. And, uh, well, it wasn't a full loaf, you know, a piece of a loaf of bread that uh, I could get and took it home. It took and it home. I never had a meal like that in my whole life. <laughs> Tell us about liberation. Hmm? Tell us about liberation and particularly about what happened in your apartment. Liberation. Um, so, all right, um, if we know, well, anybody, if in the audience, anybody is a veteran or anybody so combat, uh, that's what it was. I mean, there was street by street fighting. Uh, the Nazis, uh, it was totally rational. I mean, they knew the war was ending, they, they were defeated, the uh, city was surrounded uh, by uh, the Soviets. The air raid stopped because there was street to street fighting, right. but the artillery fire was constant. So being anywhere was, that most of the city was almost in rubble and certainly our, our building was also severely damaged. Anyhow, so finally in a neighboring building, we hear cheers, right? I was again upstairs with my father uh, and uh, several other people in the apartment who couldn't tolerate the cellar. Um, and we hear cheers, we hear people uh, shouting and singing, and in those days you didn't hear that. I mean, there was no reason to do that. So what's happening? Uh, well, somebody spotted a Soviet soldier on the street, which would have meant normally that the Nazis are gone and we, are, we, are, uh, we survived. Well, um, so we started cheering, and uh, people came up from the cellar and we hugged, and it was good until everything went dark and uh, red things were flying in uh, the apartment. Anyhow, uh, a fleeing uh, Nazi threw a grenade somehow found its way <laughs> into the apartment. Right where, into your, right into yeah, your unit. Yeah, very, very. Not just the building, I mean, it wasn't, the building wasn't targeted from the outside. This thing flew in the, through the window, actually. In your room. Yeah, yeah. and so I was there, of course, uh, with many other people. And um, anyhow, uh, what happened, I was unscathed, I kind of dove under the piano. Uh, I don't know how I knew that, but instinct took over. But many other people were. My father was actually crippled for life, as it turned out. 
and um, many other people there, some of them relative and uncle, and and their uh, her. So forever after that, um, then there is some great joy or escape from a bad situation. I always look over my shoulder for something bad to happen, and of course yeah. it doesn't, but it marks you for, for life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your father was very seriously hurt by that yeah. grenade, and it, yeah. took, it took a long time. Well, he never really did fully recover from it, did he? No, but he survived, but we didn't know that he would yeah. for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So as you said, it's, we, we've survived, the, the war is over for us, but the war is still going on elsewhere. What do we do next? And, in, in the little time we have left, yeah, maybe, don't, yeah. maybe share a little bit about, uh, and particularly when your aunt came to get you and took you to her place. Well, uh, what I did not ha have an occasion to say is, I'm talking to you of all the atrocities, all the cruelty and nastiness and evil that happened. But mixed with that, all along, they were good people. Uh, mm -hmm. There were people who, at the risk of their lives, tried to help. My aunt was one of them. Um, my youngest uncle was married to a Catholic girl um, who um, was able to maintain uh, the flat uh, in the house where they used to live. And, uh, while she still could, she tried to bring some food to us in uh, the international ghetto, and then of course she couldn't anymore. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, she found us and waded through the rubble. Of course, there were no telephones or any of that yet. Again, they were destroyed. The infrastructure was destroyed. So he found us. She found us and uh, told us that part of her apartment was intact. Part of the building was gone, actually. So we found our way through the rubble of what the city was at that point. And, um, and I have vivid memories of that. At that point, well, uh, you know, the dead litter, the city, uh, the, the roads, the, there were no roads, they were all blown up. It, it was a horrific trip and it took us a long time. But then, um, we had some shelter, and uh, we weren't quite as crowded as we were. We still didn't have much food, uh, if any, but right. um, we were out of the... I, I was gathering. struck when you shared with me that when you got to your aunt's place, you were told, don't open that door, because if you open that door, it, it just opened into a sheared off building. Actually, I op well, I peeked, uh, peeked when my aunt opened the door, yeah. and sheer nothing. It was like a stage set, if you've ever seen it. It was amazing. Some of that image is still with me. It's yeah. nothing. It's the end. You open the door, and there is just space. Yeah. Susan, before we, we close our program, one, one last question for you. In, in light of all that your parents went through, they had to have been just utterly terrified, despite your father's optimistic outlook for much of those years you've just described. How do you think your parents were able to carry on and protect you as they did through all of that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, it might sound trite, but I think love conquers all, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they just loved me. They yeah. just loved you, yeah. yeah. We, um, we're not gonna have time for um, questions from the audience for Susan, as you can see, um, we only, I think you realize we only just touched on so much of what Susan could have shared with, you, with us today. But when, Su we're going to hear from Susan again to close our program, but when Susan is done, you'll remain here with us on the stage, and we invite any of you who want to come up on the stage at that point to um, meet Susan, ask her the question you didn't get to ask, have your picture taken with her, whatever you'd like to do, we, we really mean that. We'd like you to come up here and do that. Um, I, um, if, if I had more time, I would ask Susan to describe something years later when she escaped from Hungary, because that alone is worth um, reading a book about. In fact, there will be a book about it, as a matter of fact. So, 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 so um, 
you, you're going to want to read about that and everything else. I want to thank all of you for being with us. Remind you, we'll have a, uh, our program tomorrow will be live streamed, but all of our programs this year uh, will be available on the YouTube channel of the museum. So you can, if you can't get back here in person, you can see any and all of our programs, including Susan's from today, which will be posted soon. Um, it's our tradition here at First Person that our first person gets the last word. And so I'm gonna to turn to Susan to close our program. And when Susan's done, and we ask you to stay with us for this, our photographer, Joel, is gonna come up on the stage and take a photograph of Susan with you as the background. And it's just a great, great image for Susan. Um, so we ask that you stay for that as well. So on that note, Susan. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming and listening to me. Uh, I truly appreciate that. Uh, I spoke enough, I try not to add too many words, but I, I want to share with you some of the things I've learned. Uh, it won't be too many. Uh, I think it's important to remember that fear and hate and rage can turn otherwise good people into monsters. Please remember that. Uh, you don't want to turn into monsters. Uh, being educated is very important for a variety of reasons, but it will not save you from becoming what I call a monster. Many of the people who participated in these atrocities were highly educated. I loved music, loved theater, uh, but they lost their moral compass. And what is truly important to remember is that your moral values as to what's right and what's wrong in treating other people is your greatest asset. And that's what I tried to live by and that sometimes it takes great courage to stick by it. We can see that today uh, in this country, but elsewhere, all over the world. So, I read a passage from Anne Frank. Most of you are familiar with her. She, was a, uh, she survived and then died just after liberation. She was a 14-year-old girl when she died, and she had a diary. And um, she said there, shortly before her death, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a moment before starting to improve the world. And she, uh, she was hiding. She, she was persecuted. And she was ready to improve the world when she could. So please, do the same. Don't wait a day and try to improve the world. And thank you very much. <laughs>